Hi, welcome. I'm Andrew Gall. In, this is one of a series of discussions with executives who are leading strategic change, innovation and venturing. We will hear from them with a an introduction to themselves and their organisation and we will then be discussing the impact and the mitigation of this pandemic crisis. In the live sessions uh, we have questions and in-depth discussions with senior peers uh, during this session. We have now edited out those sort of discussions for confidentiality of those participants. The resources and podcasts are available uh, with videos on the Aim of Our Resources website. Please enjoy, make comments and do get in touch. Thank you. So, Min, we've known each other now for so many years. I think even back to when you were in Unilever in San Francisco and um, mm -hmm. we were with you in uh, Shanghai in November when you participated with a colleague of mine uh, in an electric vehicle uh, session. So really pleased to have you on board. So. Please, if you could introduce yourself and introduce uh, CM Ventures, please. And so thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm going to just uh, show a few slides about, uh, only two slides about CM, because I think it's uh, much better to introduce the CM Venture with the slides. So let me just uh, load up. Yeah, so CM Venture Capital, we invest uh, uh, primarily in four sectors. So materials, advanced manufacturing, energy, here we mean new energy, and the environment. Uh, and then the last one is digital industrial. So I would say materials is our uh, fundamental foundation and it supports probably around 40% of our investments, although the application may be in different sectors. So we are very fortunate to have the support and, uh, of uh, six uh, corporations in our fund. So Samsung, BSF, GE, Sabic, British American Tobacco and Henker are in our fund too. And uh, we are talking to a number of uh, new corporates who are looking to join our fund three. So we are, are quite uh, privileged to uh, work with um, uh, really great uh, multinational companies that are very, uh, have long history in the sectors that we invest in. So the next slide just show an example of our current uh, Fund 2 portfolio. I, I'm not going to talk about each company, but uh, just to say that we invest broadly into uh, materials. Uh, for example, we have a portfolio company in transparent conductive electrode, in electronic material, in 3D printing equipment and material. Um, we also have uh, companies in, uh, related to 5G, in advanced component for 5G optical communication. We have company in semiconductor, so uh, China's leading third generation semiconductor company. Uh, we have company in uh, waste management, and that's our environment portfolio, so biodigester for organic waste. We also invested in hydrogen uh, economy, so uh, China's uh, currently leading hydrogen station and own vehicle equipment company go for hydrogen. And we also have invested in uh, autonomous driving uh, um, company, uh, which makes a domain controller unit for autonomous driving, as well as uh, autonomous drone operation. So, um, and the last one, we also invested in a UK company called Cambridge Touch Technologies, which is in ultra touch technology for display. So this uh, portfolio uh, literally for 10 companies, you can see that we invest nine of these 10 companies are in China. We have one company in, in Europe currently. Uh, so we invest roughly, um, I would say up to 20% abroad, uh, but 80% in China. Uh, and the sectors uh, are quite uh, broad. So we always say we're not a sector specific fund. So we're not a mobility fund or we're not a clean tech fund, but we really look at the underlying science, which is uh, physical science and then IT, so digital. So look at uh, all the uh, industry sectors that uh, are supported by these science platforms. So that's, those are my two slide introduction of CM Venture. Maybe you could give us a bit more of an introduction in terms of why do the corporates invest in your fund? What's the, the, the reasons that they're given the benefits they see for being involved with, with CM Ventures? 
Oh, I think with two of our investors on the call, I, uh, <laughs> maybe they can t tell you better. Uh, but I think uh, primarily uh, um, for two really two uh, reasons, the corporates are working with uh, w working with us. Uh, one is uh, certainly um, China is uh, um, as ch as China invests more and more in R and D and build up more capabilities in innovation. Uh, China the, to understand the innovation landscape in China is uh, quite important as part of the global open innovation initiative for the corporates. So I, um, CM has been in the market for 10 years uh, and has a database of over 4,000 companies in the physical science area. So I think it uh, provides the corporates with uh, a good, uh, uh, good starting point to understand the China's innovation landscape and uh, build, uh, extend their own team's efforts in terms of uh, uh, deal sourcing and uh, innovation sourcing. So I think that's the primary reason uh, for, for joining our fund. And the second, second point is really, uh, it's a great time to invest in China right now, uh, even better these years than compared to previous years, because uh, China, um, in terms of exit market for VC-backed physical science companies, I believe that China is the best place right now in terms of being able to list companies that are more in manufacturing, in physical sciences, as well as getting a good valuation for the company. As you know, it's very difficult to, uh, to actually list a materials company on the NASDAQ or on the US or European stock market. So China currently provide a very good exit for these companies and we are able to achieve a good return for our investors. So I think combining a good access to innovation and also to have good financial return, uh, I think that's really the two reasons that the corporates are joining us. I'd, I'd reiterate that, certainly the, the work that I do with corporates, getting understanding of a market, getting an understanding of technology, getting an understanding of business models and, and areas that are changing um, is certainly a big benefit of, of investing sort of within, within a fund. So, Min, I think the, the key topic that we've got within these series is about what's happening related to sort of COVID, what's happening relates to the business sort of side of things. And, and for the benefit of those who, who aren't, living in china you know you've been mm -hmm. through now china's been through the first wave of this and things are getting getting back to a new normal maybe you could just give us a bit of uh, an introduction to what the new normal is like in china in terms of just as a normal citizen traveling around wearing masks um you know temperature checks the apps you're using and things like that if you could give us a little bit of an introduction and context of that first please yeah sure so so uh, um, I actually wanted to show you just a, a nice picture of Shanghai to start. Uh, that was taken uh, just uh, uh, a few days ago. There was a beautiful sunset in Shanghai. And uh, yeah, that's literally only, I think, last week in Shanghai. And uh, so uh, pretty much uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned or what I can see, I think Shanghai is uh, quite back to normal. And I feel that uh, the coming out of COVID, it really came in waves. So the startups literally are the first to come back to work because I suppose startups, you can never afford to uh, be uh, not working for very long. So all our portfolio companies uh, came back to work uh, back in February. So CM actually started on February 10, which is like feels like ages ago already. And all our portfolio companies uh, um, uh, were back to work before end of February. And uh, so uh, in the startup universe, it uh, has been quite uh, uh, normal for already two months. Yeah, so I was saying the startups uh, with uh, being always uh, constantly in crisis, right? The startups are the first to come back to work. And uh, for VCs, uh, we pretty much was calling with our portfolio companies during the months of uh, February and March. And then from April, we are meeting uh, startups in office and all visiting them. So by now, it's uh, pretty much back to normal um, in, in terms of our business. Uh, traveling to Beijing still has some restriction, but uh, 
uh, because we have a Beijing office, so our Beijing team covers the Beijing markets and we cover the rest of the, uh, the Shanghai and the China Delta region. So it uh, has been quite normal for us for already a few months. And yeah, the quite normal for you in China, though, is a bit different to the quite normal for us sort of in the UK. So you're wearing masks and that now when you're when you're outdoors and that all the time. Is that mandatory? Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not mandatory. I think most of people are still wearing it. Yeah, I'm the one who usually who doesn't get used to the mask. So I'm just going around my life with uh, uh, when I jog or when I work out. I don't wear masks. But uh, okay. yeah. So if you go into public transportation, you need to wear masks. Yeah. Okay. And the um, the use of apps like WeChat and Alipay you know, is phenomenal in China. I've known for traveling there for about three years now for doing payments uh, and transactions. And those apps are being used for, to give green, amber, red sort of indications of whether you can use certain bits of services and that there. Are those, are those widely used now? So, yeah, for MNC companies, for multinational companies, they are very strict about that. So every time I visit either BSF or Hanker and so on, I have to register and show that uh, the green code. Uh, I guess it's a big company come back to normal later because they have much many more employees to manage. So for visiting MNC companies, you need to show that. But for regular visit to other startups, that so we don't uh, have that kind of uh, procedure. Okay, and you said traveling between cities. So you traveling from Shanghai to Beijing, there's there's limitations or restrictions on movement and that that around at the moment, is there? No, so I, I can go to Beijing and check in a hotel with uh, the green code, the house code. So uh, it's for Beijing residents who travel outside of Beijing, who return to Beijing, have some restriction. But I think that's going to lift very soon because the China's uh, the political bureau meeting happens on May 21st and 22nd. I think uh, um, after that, all restrictions are going to ease up and basically it should be back to normal. The discussion we've had on a number of our other calls has been around, you know, as you just touched on here, the, you know, for startups, the cash situation, the changing mm -hmm. customer requirements to moving online or not being able to close big deals because of the, their big multinational customers aren't, you know, have, have been in lockdown longer. What's, what's the current play on, you know, what's the current situation within your portfolio or in portfolios more generally in terms of cash runway? and follow on investments and things like that. Can you give us a bit of an insight on the um, on that startup market? Yeah, sure. So our portfolio out of our nine companies in China, five of them actually still grew this uh, first quarter compared to the first quarter last year. And uh, none actually have uh, suffering from any cash, uh, uh, cash crunch. Uh, what, several reasons, most of them raised a, a new round last year and that really helps. And I was talking to just a bank head just today and asking about what about bad loan and so on. So what happens is that even banks see very few default or defaulting risk because a lot of the Chinese businesses, they get their account receivable or big payment at the year end, just before the Chinese New Year. So the time that it happens in, the Q, in Q1, uh, in the year is uh, kind of fortunate because for most of the businesses, Q1 was already anyways a uh, low season and uh, they usually get all their cash, big cash payment received in Q4 last year. So that helps to tide over uh, the companies. So our, among the startups that we invest in, the companies that uh, get impacted the most is uh, companies with export business. Like you said, uh, because currently the US and Europe are slowing down and the decisions are not made. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, basically uh, one of our company has majority of their business export to uh, Korea, Japan and uh, US and Europe. So that company is impacted because the, basically the customer, um, customers slow down. And then the other type of business that get impacted is if they sell to multinational company businesses in China, because a lot of those uh, decisions are still made at multinational headquarters. And because the US and Europe slow down, then there's, uh, the purchase order slows down from the multinational company China businesses. 
So also if the startups are mainly addressing the China market, actually we see a very uh, limited impact on the portfolio. So uh, most of the businesses are back to normal and uh, there is really a great sense of urgency in China. I think it's uh, uh, difficult to describe, but because the first quarter was called sort of lost for the uh, for many companies, now there's a really great sense of urgency to uh, get it, uh, the lost business back. So we see a tremendous sort of activity in like uh, starting April, and, and uh, we are busier than ever uh, before. At least I don't see any state aid that uh, is uh, showing up on our startups. Uh, uh, financial. It's like nice to have a little bit of help, uh, some rent rent uh, reduction or some uh, social security payment, but uh, yeah, it's peanut. If you ask any entrepreneurs, they will tell you that the state aid sounds like a lot. The government pushing out a list of policies, but when it actually gets executed, it's actually amounts to very, very little. So like U.S. style of uh, uh, big loan or bridge loan to the startup and so on. So I think, uh, um, yes, yeah, so the China market and the U.S. market is uh, quite uh, different at this moment. So all the, uh, currently we are seeing tremendous uh, investment opportunity in the U.S. because the U.S. venture literally stop or freeze. And then there is a, a really funding gap for startups in the U.S. market. I'd reiterate some of that. I think there's big announcements in the UK as well about you know, supporting businesses. But when in the ventures I'm involved with, you know, and helping to 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 raise raise monies, you know, that taking more debt onto your balance sheet doesn't necessarily help the business and that going forward. And the the grants or the the uh, the other sort of in, incentives are relatively small for for the businesses. So there's you know they have to sort it out in in a lot of cases to, for 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 themselves. First of all, uh, for our fund three, we are actually talking to more Asian investors than ever. So there's a lot more Asian investors from outside of China who are interested in China market and uh, uh, getting uh, to into the China eco ecosystem. Uh, and also because the Asian uh, corporates are under invested in venture. And so the, at this time of crisis, they don't have a big portfolio to have to do bridge financing for. So they actually have more money to deploy. And so it's a great time for them to get into the venture business and deploy capital. Uh, compared to like if you already have a portfolio of 100 companies or 50 that 30 of them need your bridge financing, then you are in trouble, right? So the, mm. we, see, we see Asian investors getting more active. Uh, in the corporate uh, venture space. And we also recently brought on a venture partner who is based in Japan and who is very well connected with the Japanese corporates uh, who are helping our portfolio companies to work with the Japanese, uh, uh, Japan market and Japan corporates. And uh, certainly, um, I think, uh, well, the China-Japan relationship is way better now compared to like a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, um, so we are looking, certainly, I think uh, it will be uh, more and more activity in between Asia, so between China and the rest of the Asian countries. We recently started to look at like Malaysia, uh, with mm -hmm. uh, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, those uh, um, countries, we are looking at uh, some uh, investment opportunities there. Uh, but uh, by and large, we are still focused on China, and uh, because, as I said, right now we see big, uh, tremendous of activity in the China market. I think uh, mm. some of the funds, the Chinese VC funds, are out of capital, or they uh, so there are just a fewer players in the market, and we see uh, literally like 20 or 30 percent more deals every month now compared to like a year ago. Mm. for our fund. So currently we are very, very busy with uh, China focused uh, deals, but we try to help our portfolio companies to work with, our, uh, to get into other Asian markets. Okay. Good, you. good. So but while we're waiting for others to ask a question, I've got a perspective I'd like your view on that China went through the SARS wave, it went through the financial crisis wave, We've seen the rise of Alibaba. We've seen the rise of JD.com coming out of those previous um, 
uh, sort of areas. And also, as I touched on earlier, the likes of WeChat and Alipay. So the China's penetration for mobile devices, online e-commerce, delivery sort of type commerce. I feel now the West is going through that change. Now we're all in lockdown. We're seeing those types of, of, of areas that might sort of catch up with uh, what's happened in Asia, in China. But what's the next wave of technologies that you're seeing that China is now developing? You know, autonomous vehicles, autonomous delivery, um, unmanned stores. You know, I visited places like that in China in October and November, and, I, and I'm starting to see some of those now on the WeChat and sort of stuff like that on the social media in, in China. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing mm -hmm. a new wave now of, of technologies and business models which have happened as part of this, this crisis? So actually, I, I prepared a few slides. So I actually, I thought about it, like, how do I describe what's post-COVID compared to, like, pre-COVID-19? And uh, I, uh, I basically summarized in three themes. I'm sure there are many more themes, but uh, I try to just convey what's on top of my mind when I think about what's post-COVID versus pre-COVID-19. And the first one is certainly, uh, I'm sure everybody who is based in China have heard about it and everybody is talking about it, is what's called Xin Jijian. And uh, that's uh, new infrastructure construction. And it came out basically as an industrial guidance for, it's not a stimulus in a sense that it's tied to a specific amount of dollar, but that's what the government is promoting as uh, uh, in terms of uh, investing uh, state resources in building up the economy. So the new infrastructure construction uh, basically have five main focus areas. One is 5G, one is connected cars, one is a satellite and uh, on the sea cable, one is cloud computing, and the other is industrial internet. So those are the five main focus areas for what's called uh, the new infrastructure construction, so, or NIC, what we short name it. And if you look at those uh, areas, it uh, uh, basically it, um, uh, is building up more IT infrastructure, and it's very much related to building more IT infrastructure. So instead of building the roads and more airports or physical infrastructure, the government is trying to build up more IT infrastructure, which I think makes great sense currently because the more roads and uh, uh, physical infrastructure investment have now diminishing return on investment, as China is quite uh, well developed in terms of physical infrastructure. So spending more money on the IT, in, in, uh, IT infrastructure has a higher return on capital uh, at this uh, economic development stage of China. So I think it's a very good policy to uh, come out to say, uh, let's uh, push for new new infrastructure development, but it's more related to building up the IT infrastructure. So it uh, aligns very well with our CM's investment focus. So uh, because a lot of the materials and advanced manufacturing goes into these uh, these uh, new infrastructure spending. So that's one one hot uh, word or hot phrase in China uh, after the COVID, post the COVID. And the next one is a zizu ke kong in Chinese. And it's really about autonomy and controllable. So translating to autonomy and controllable. And it's uh, basically a sense, I think it's a whole global world is getting the sense that uh, having uh, uh, basically too much dependence on another country is dangerous for the country itself. So China, um, especially since there was China-US trade war, so a lot of the technology is uh, 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 basically China realized it needs to develop its own technology. And so autonomy and controllable becomes a very big topic in the China uh, landscape or today. And I want to say that it's not only China, I, I believe, that is going that route. Even when we look at the US startups today, uh, quite a few of them are getting very strong support from the US government because the US government, the US society also believes that there's too much reliance on China for their manufacturing uh, 
supply chain. So getting more autonomy and controllable supply chain and technology in the country is becoming a trend, I think, I believe globally. So it creates interesting opportunity in um, both in China and in the in US and Europe, I'm sure. So uh, because, for example, I just give you an example. We were looking at a PCB technology company based in the US. You would think that PCB is so like uh, um, uh, so common now, right? So China makes the world's, uh, has probably worth 90% of PCB manufacturing capacity. But the US startup is trying to develop its next generation PCB technology because it wants to have autonomy and controllable and the more advanced PCB technology within on the US soil. So that's uh, uh, basically uh, that we wouldn't see before, like uh, in, among the US startups. So I think I want to say it's not just the China phenomenon, but China is trying to do the same. Like uh, I think one of the participants said before, China is lacking in semiconductor in a lot of uh, uh, um, also IT technology, so there's a great sense of urgency in China to develop uh, the technologies that China still lacks. And then the third uh, difference that we, I think we see is the change is really about to be. So a lot of the innovation in China is known for, like uh, Andrew, what you were mentioning, are to see businesses. So China leads in, in terms of WeChat or uh, a lot of the uh, well-known public company uh, outside of China actually are to see business models because for a long time to be is not a very profitable business model in China uh, but now there's uh, uh, just a tremendous emphasis on to be uh, businesses uh, to because a lot of the high-tech uh, business needs to be sell sold to another high business so it's to be so for us it's actually uh, uh, great because we have only invested in two big companies or, uh, uh, from our day one, so 2010 to uh, now. So in the last 10 years, we have been quite, uh, in the first five years, we have been quite lonely because most VC funds are focused on to see businesses and uh, only now to be becomes more fashionable. And I think uh, post COVID-19, the to be is also going to be more and more fashionable. And if you look at the public exits, like listing on the uh, Kotwanban or the new listings, those are primary to be businesses. So it's a great time for the to be business uh, uh, to be businesses models. So because of that, uh, uh, those three factors, like that, those are just the top three that came up on my head, mind when I think about post COVID nineteen. Uh, what we have, uh, what to see from CM Venture Capital, what we are doing is to uh, really uh, take these trends and look at businesses A, that is in the new infrastructure construction plan, B, the, uh, the business that develop critical technology, or the first in China technology uh, that is uh, related to autonomy, uh, uh, technology autonomy. So critical technologies that uh, really fills a gap, not another better mousetrap, for example, or another uh, better product that may be better, but it's not that critical. And then the third point, we are really uh, adjusting to look at uh, capital efficient business models in among the to be businesses, because the to be business already has usually long like account receivable and uh, uh, cycle. Uh, it's not like a to see business where you just uh, get cash. So um, and in today's environment where the capital is not uh, uh, is uh, scarce than before, we are even more focused on capital efficient business models. So we are really adjusting our uh, investment uh, uh, strategy to say, okay, how do we invest in companies that will uh, be in high growth market that uh, brings the critical technology or the first uh, in China technology or first in US technology it, uh, in the case of autonomy and uh, looking for capital efficient business models. Those are great insights, and, I, and I, it certainly for me it reflects on some of the areas that we've worked on before. And I said when I when I was in uh, Shanghai with you in November, when we were looking at the electric vehicle space, 
um, mm-hmm. you know, the points you made there about 5G connected cloud, the mm-hmm. um, the um, being able to manufacture those in the new industrial sort of way. Uh, and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I think you're, you're really right. Right there, there's autonomy and control sort of side of things that the, the the West is going to have to build up its capabilities to catch up with China with the scale and speed on some of the new technologies and electronics that they, that, that China has done, uh, and also the reliance on that between the between the two sides is going to become more more of a challenge. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, dare to say I know what the political leaders are thinking, but uh, uh, currently we don't see a very big, a huge uh, policy push push towards. Uh, towards the sustainability uh, issue. And uh, uh, I think uh, for the waste management, it's more out of uh, practical because, uh, for example, Shanghai and Beijing are running out of uh, waste uh, incineration plant. So they got to find a solution for waste management. And then we see a big investment from uh, like uh, SOE into uh, clean energy in terms of like solar or uh, wind or those I think will continue. Uh, in the uh, new energy or renewable, and then the push towards the hydrogen economy. But all those, I think, are more driven by the economic factor uh, uh, than by the... It, it economically makes sense. Of course, it does also society good, but uh, uh, if you look at, uh, like, hydrogen economy, there's a great... Uh, uh, business model or why China is, uh, should develop a hydrogen economy. It benefits the if you look at the investment and the amount of GDP that uh, hydrogen economy can produce, it's uh, really a good return on investment. And uh, so I believe that the China policy making is a very sort of technocrat looking at uh, uh, what's the return on investment and what's the economic picture. Uh, certainly with the economy now slowing down, it's uh, I think the overall driving force is about how to develop the economy uh, uh, making more bang out of the buck for investment. So I, I wouldn't say think that the social or the environmental consideration is the number one factor right now uh, uh, for, for, for this period. Anyway, we have uh, in this uh, written five slides uh, on the new infrastructure construction. It's on our website uh, if anyone is interested in more details of each of those five areas. Uh, we have uh, uh, written a newsletter that uh, describes those uh, five areas. And I want to add that we're not just investing in those five areas. Uh, we are still investing in the other areas that are not in the NIC, but uh, it's just uh, what's new post-COVID. Uh, in terms of uh, the international collaboration, um, I certainly think that in the short term, uh, there will be a shock to this whole accelerating globalization before. So mm-hmm. up to now, we have always been more and more globalized. And I think this shock is uh, putting everybody more concerned about globalization. So in the short term, there will be, uh, I certainly think uh, I would be lying if I don't think, that I say that I think the international collaboration is going to be impacted in the short term. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, for by this uh, current uh, current situation, but I think uh, as an investor, what we need to do is to look at uh, any opportunity in any challenge, right? So mm-hmm. I feel like uh, in this autonomy and uh, uh, in this uh, period, you still have great investment opportunity both uh, in China and uh, abroad because of this uh, situation. So mm-hmm. what we what we basically what we do is to look at the situation and say, okay, how do we invest in this uh, current climate? Min has done a great job in introducing CM Ventures, giving us perspective on the areas of uh, investment focus she's got, and I've certainly learned a lot here in terms of those um, those tech areas and the uh, trading to business as opposed to, to to consumers and that that she's highlighted. Any other questions? Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much, Min, for your contribution that today. It's been excellent. Um, we're going to try and turn this into uh, a podcast or a short video that uh, you can share with your colleagues and that. And we've got uh, previous ones which are now available on the uh, aim of our YouTube channel. 
and uh, on our podcast channel, Gaul's Question Time on uh, iTunes and other platforms. So we'll we'll circulate those after and that to the participants. And we've got uh, four more scheduled calls coming up. Uh, next week, we've got um, Ivonic, um, Bernard Moa. We've got um, Eric Steger from Anthem Insurance in the States. And we've got Silicon Valley Bank um, at the at the end of the month. So um, have a look at the Eventbrite for the future sort of sessions. And great, you can join us. So finally, yeah. thanks very much again, Min. Very good to see you. And thanks for your first broadcast in this sort of format. You were excellent. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I, uh, thanks for the good questions. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to see you and hear you on this platform. So thanks for the opportunity, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you man. Thank, thank you, you as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and do subscribe to the podcasts or to the videos and look at aim of our resources. Feel free to drop us an email or a message and be very happy to to follow up. Thank you.